What about, for example, about demons? If we would say that a demon possesses a human body, when they're exorcised or they just leave, let's say, would we say that a, a, a demon or that spiritual substance was human? No, now that's a really good question, but I do not think that demonic possession is a case of a union so intimate as the union of the soul with its body. This, I think, is a really uncomfortable or awkward implication of classical Christology that the soul of Christ is impersonal, which seems really strange to me. Hey, Dr. Craig, we're so glad to have you with us today discussing this very, very interesting topic about Christology or the doctrine of Christ. I know that you've been working on your philosophical theology on this subject, or I believe that you just finished it. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that and where is it going? Yes, I have just finished the first draft of the section on the doctrine of Christ, and it comprises three parts. The person of Christ, which is a defense uh, and model of the incarnation. And then secondly, uh, the work of Christ, which is a defense and model of uh, Christ's substitutionary atonement for our sins. And then the third part is an excursus on the historicity of the resurrection of Christ. Awesome. Uh, your website, Reasonable Faith, is filled with articles, your Defenders class, your lectures on your YouTube channel. It's really, really great the amount of information that is available online. And some of our chapter directors sent a bunch of questions dealing with this subject. So I'm going to go ahead and start with the first question. And I think it's the more natural one to begin. What is the doctrine of the Incarnation? The doctrine of the Incarnation simply stated is that Jesus Christ is truly God and truly man. You know, usually people don't give this doctrine the importance that they should. Sometimes, I mean, Christians all over the world within the church take Jesus to be a mere prophet or just a good teacher. Why is the doctrine of the Incarnation of vital importance for Christians? Well, I think, Raul, that our very salvation depends upon Christ's substitutionary atonement for our sins as the God-man. No mere human being could bear the punishment for the sins of mankind because every single person a merely human person, is a sinner who already owes to God um, a debt of sin that uh, he cannot pay. And therefore, if our uh, debt of punishment to God is to be satisfactorily discharged, then there must be a God-man uh, who is perfect and sinless and therefore able to atone for the sins of mankind. So I think the doctrine of the Incarnation, as St. Anselm saw, lies at the very heart of the Christian faith. Well, definitely it's of vital importance for us. Now, when discussing, or when you define the doctrine of the Incarnation, you mentioned that uh, Jesus is truly God and truly man. And we're going to uh, unpack that as uh, we go forth with uh, this Q&A. But when discussing this doctrine, there is a lot of theological and philosophical terminology that honestly goes over my head and goes over, over everybody's heads when trying to study this. Why don't you help us define what the following terms mean? Person, nature, soul, mind, and body. All right. I am not one who is terribly concerned with technical, precise definitions. Uh, I use words in the way in which they're used in ordinary 
language. So a person, uh, to me, is an intellectual substance uh, having a capacity for self-consciousness, rationality, and freedom of the will. By a nature, I mean the essential properties of a thing. Uh, those thing properties that the thing must have in order to be the kind of thing that it is. By a soul, I mean an immaterial living substance, which is the seat of phenomenal states of consciousness, like pain, sensations, intentionality, and so forth. And this definition leaves it open that there could be non-personal animal souls as well as personal human souls. By a mind, I mean the same thing as a soul, um, unless you think of a mind as simply consciousness, um, such that a soul could have more than one consciousness. And so there are models of the Incarnation offered by Christian philosophers whereby Christ, though one person and having but one soul, nevertheless has two minds or two consciousnesses. I tend to use mind and soul synonymously myself. And finally, by a body, I just mean a physical organism. All right. Well, I am a person of definition, so I like to have my concepts very clearly defined to understand uh, a lot of, of this philosophical discussion. Now, you said that you take soul and mind as almost or synonymous, uh, mm -hmm. but what would be the difference between person and soul? Ah, now this is a disputed question. Is a person a soul? Or does a person have a soul? Until very recently, in writing my systematic philosophical theology, I was undecided about this. It seems to me that either view could be held by uh, a Christian. You could say that I am a composite entity made up of a body and a soul. And so I am not a soul, but I have a soul, and certainly this is an ordinary way of speaking of human persons as body-soul composites. On the other hand, many substance dualists who believe in the reality of the soul think that the person is the soul who has a body. So a person is identical to a soul and has a body to which it is intimately connected and uses as an instrument for thought and action and perception in the world. And in my systematic philosophical theology, I present an argument, which I'll be sharing in the fall at the annual Evangelical Philosophical Society conference, that in fact, um, human persons are souls, that uh, each of us is identical to his soul. So we are not composite entities, we are souls who have bodies. And interestingly enough, this conclusion came about not as a result of my study of um, doctrine of man, but as a result of the, my study of the doctrine of Christ. It was Christology which led me to this conclusion based on my rejection of compositional models of the Incarnation. All right. So, um, forgive me, I'm just going to um, confirm. You said that you would say, you would reject the idea of body, that we are body-soul composites, but that we are souls that have a body. Yes. All right, so wouldn't that make mind, person, and soul identical? Yes. Yes, all right, okay. Well, I guess that, that's going to come up uh, in as we go along with more of the, our questions here. Um, thank you for that clarification. Mm -hmm. Now, when analyzing these ancient creeds, like the, the Nicene Creed and the, the creed that came from the Council of Chalcedon, I believe, um, mm -hmm. we are cautious about imposing our contemporary definitions 
onto historical terminology, which could lead to anachronistic interpretation and mistaken conclusions. What fundamental distinctions exist between our contemporary comprehension of these terms and the understanding prevalent during the era of these councils? Well, I think one distinction would be that when the church fathers spoke of uh, natures or essences of things, they were talking about what are called kind essences. That is to say, there are certain natural kinds of things like horses and pigs and uh, humans and palm trees and chairs and rocks, things of that sort. And to be a member of a certain kind, you need to have the essential properties uh, of that kind of thing. On the contemporary scene, uh, people who believe in essences often talk about individual essences rather than kind essences. So my individual essence would be the essence of William Lane Craig, and that is an essence which no one else can share. So that even though you and I have the same kind essence, we do not have the same individual essence. So that would be one difference. Another difference would be uh, whether natures are concrete or abstract. On the contemporary scene, we tend to think of natures as sets of properties and therefore as abstractions that are possessed by a concrete object. But before the Church Fathers and many medievals, they would often use the word nature to designate a concrete object so that a nature would be uh, an individual substance uh, of some sort um, and therefore not an abstraction. And part of the difficulty of interpreting these conciliar statements is to understand whether or not they're speaking of natures in a concrete or an abstract sense. All right, definitely. It's not really easy for us moderns to do that. Um, I, I guess the, the, the next questions are all related to, to oh. this subject as well, because, for example, philosopher Tim Paul and others have characterized human nature as a composite of body and soul, suggesting that it comprises concrete objects, being the body and the soul, which and the body would be the physical object, but given this perspective, how should we interpret the divine nature if it's described merely through a set of abstract properties, such as omniscience, aseity, necessity, omnipotence, and moral perfection? Mm -hmm. Well, before I address your question, I don't think that Timothy Paul takes a stand on whether we are composites of soul and body or whether we just are souls who have Bodies. Now, perhaps he's expressed himself on this in a writing that I haven't read, but for the um, things that I have read from Professor Paul, I don't believe that he takes a firm position on that question. Now, with respect to God, the concrete divine nature is the instantiation of that abstract nature that you described. The abstract nature of God would include these properties like omniscience, aseity, necessity, omnipotence, and moral perfection. And God's concrete nature is that concrete entity that instantiates that abstract nature. Um, so really there's no conflict here between these two views of natures. Uh, God is the concrete object that exemplifies the properties that you just mentioned. Now, uh, the next one relates uh, to your work. It says here, Dr. Craig, in lesson five of your defenders class, you articulated that the church fathers in affirming Christ's dual nature, natures recognize that Christ embodies all properties essential to body to both humanity and divinity. However, in question of the week 81, 
you noted that while the natures as collection of properties are abstract, the Chalcedonian definition treats Christ's human nature concretely, comprising of a rational soul and body, and not merely as abstract objects. Could you clarify this apparent discrepancy, and how should we understand the term nature in the context of Chalcedonian theology and its relevance to the conceptualization of abstract and concrete objects in the Incarnation? I think, Raul, that there's general agreement that both ways of speaking are legitimate, and in fact, they imply each other. Um, Christ would be uh, that concrete object that exemplifies or instantiates the abstract human nature and abstract uh, divine nature. And his abstract divine nature and abstract human nature are exemplified or instantiated by that concrete object that is uh, Jesus Christ. So I don't think a whole lot hangs, honestly, on whether we advocate an abstractist or a concretist Christology. Um, they are mutually implying. So long as we are Chalcedonian Christians, we are committed to there being natures. There are such things as natures. Now, any Chalcedonian abstractist will recognize that Christ instantiates both divinity and humanity and so has, as a result, a concrete divine nature and a concrete human nature. And by the same token, any Chalcedonian concretist recognizes that Christ's divine nature is an instantiation of the abstract divine essence, and his human nature is an instantiation of the abstract uh, human nature. So both methods uh, or ways of speaking are legitimate. That's interesting. Are there school of, of thoughts within Chalcedonian, like... Uh, concretist? Concretist, and the, and the other ones were, were worthy? Abstractist. Abstracts it. Okay, so uh, those are school of thoughts in Christian philosophy? Yes, yes. As you mentioned earlier, Timothy Paul, in his fine defense of the coherence of Chalcedonian Christology, adopts a concretist approach to the divinity and humanity of Christ. By contrast, Richard Swinburne is very emphatic on using an abstractist approach to Chalcedon, and either approach is um, uh, legitimate. And where would you, uh, um, where would you find yourself in, in these schools of thought? Well, as I say, I think they're mutually implying. Okay. So since I do believe in natures, I think that there, for example, let's take God, that God is a concrete object uh, and that he instantiates this abstract divine nature called divinity or deity. Got it. Okay, let's go to the next question. Now, I, I guess maybe I should just add, <laughs> I wrote this is for clarification of this muddies the water. But when I speak of these abstract natures, I don't really think that they exist as objects out there in the world. I'm an anti-Platonist. I don't think there are these Platonic abstractions. I think this is simply a useful way of speaking of the properties that something necessarily has. Yeah, you know, this is one of the wonders uh, that we encountered when studying about the doctrine of the, in the Incarnation, because it takes you from uh, through all of philosophical uh, subjects, like philosophy of mind and abstract objects. So I knew that you were going to be interested uh, as well on, on that particular thread of the discussion, and it might come yes. up um, um, later on. Okay, uh, let's go to the next question. Uh, in your response to question... 479, you define the term soul as follows, and I quote, by a soul I mean a living spiritual substance. You further elaborate that a human soul has a rational cognitive faculties, but is not identical with its rational faculties. Based on this distinction, can we conceptualize 
a person as a unique configuration of cognitive and rational faculties with its locus or seat within the soul? Well, I don't think that we want to say that a person is a set of faculties. So I don't think we should conceptualize a person as a unique configuration of faculties. Rather, a person is what has those faculties. Uh, a person is a concrete object that has the faculties that we've been talking about, uh, and it must have certain capacities like self-consciousness, rationality, and freedom of the will. Then I guess you would re reject that premise because the next question assumes uh, that uh, distinction or, or that definition of person and asks that if this is the case, it seems that the soul of Jesus is a separate non-personal entity from the Logos. Mm. And the Logos brings the sufficient properties of personhood to this substance. Would this be a correct view or incorrect view? Well, I must say, Raul, that that seems to be an implication of classical uh, Christology, which makes a distinction between the Logos and Jesus' soul. On the classical Orthodox view, Jesus' soul is not personal, uh, lest one lapse into Nestorianism and you have two persons in Christ. Um, nor does his soul become personal as a result of its union with the Logos. Again, that would make you have two persons in, in Christ, a human person and a divine person. But the doctrine of the Incarnation is that there is only one person in Christ, a divine person, the second person of the Trinity. So this, I think, is a really uncomfortable or awkward implication of classical Christology that the soul of Christ is impersonal, which seems really strange to me. All right, but let's go to the next question. Uh, Stephen Nemes, I hope I'm not butchering his name, has offered an argument that points to the impossibility of the Incarnation due to a lack of philosophical analysis of the relationship between person and nature. In your view, Dr. Craig, how do we relate persons to natures? Is a person ontologically prior, coeval, but distinct to nature, or person is simply nature? Well, no, I don't know Stephen Neem's argument here uh, firsthand, but based on what you say, Raul, this doesn't look to me like an argument against the Incarnation. Uh, it looks to me like an argument against persons having natures. Uh, it would apply to ordinary human persons like you or me. Uh, indeed, when you think about it, it seems to apply against anything's having a nature. Now, on my anti-realist view of abstract objects, a person is not distinct from his nature, nor identical to his nature, because there are no such things as natures. Uh, to speak of natures is just a useful way of speaking. It, it's pretense or make-believe um, that we use to talk about the essential features that a thing has. Now, just a small parenthesis here, uh, when you say uh, like make-believe, would you then fall into the camp of fictionalism uh, in your anti-Platonist ah, uh, views? No, no, I would not. Now, it's important to realize that there is a, a cornucopia of anti-realist views on offer today, and I discuss these in my book, God Overall. One of these views is fictionalism, which, oh boy, I hate to get too technical here, but fictionalism accepts the neoquinian criterion of ontological commitment and and the implication of that is that um, mathematical statements since they refer to abstract objects are false that it is false that two plus two equals four and i don't agree with that at all. So uh, although fictionalism is one type of anti-realism, it's not the type I embrace. 
I like the view called neutralism, which rejects the neoquinian criterion of ontological commitment and says that there can be mathematical truths and other truths referring to abstract objects um, without there actually being abstract objects in the world. These are just um, uh, façon de parler, just a manner of speaking, uh, pretense, um, but we are not committed to their reality by uh, uttering statements about them that we take to be true. Uh, neutralism rejects that criterion of ontological commitment. All right, thank you for that question, for that clarification. Now, the next question, I might need to modify it a little bit from what we just uh, talked about, about the definitions, because the, mm -hmm. well, the question reads like this. We want to refer that being human implies being a body and soul composite, which we already talked about that you uh, reject. Um, right. A human person is a soul intimately united to its body as an instrument. But in affirming that, we arrive to two problems. Now, before you go to the two problems, I just want to point out for our listeners that those two statements that you just read are not the same. They express different views. The first statement is that a human being is identical to a soul-body composite. The second statement says that a human person is a soul which is intimately united to its body as an instrument. So do you see the difference between those two? The one says that I have a soul. The other one says that I am a soul. Ah, all right, all right. I see what you're saying there. Now, well, taking these two views, how would we see then the death of Christ when he sees when he uh, took his last breath on the cross, his soul, if we define death as the separation of soul and body, did Jesus stop being incarnate and therefore stop being human and thrusting us in a, some sort of heresy, denying momentarily the incarnation or something like that? On classical Christology, the human soul of Jesus is distinct from the Logos, and therefore the human soul of Jesus continues to exist after his death, and so he does have a human nature. Uh, on my view, I would say that Christ uh, retains his human nature after the death of the body because he was united with a human body um, and is therefore a human soul. All right, so what, well, I guess it, it, it will, we'll um, expand on that when we reach uh, the discussion of uh, neo-Apollinarianism, but just uh, yeah. right now that you mention it, you would say that the adjective of human soul, or, or no, not, not human soul, but human person or, or human nature, Jesus would retain that even after his death, because he had it. Because he had a human body. That's right. That the person who survives the death of the body is a person that had a human body. Uh, and therefore, in that sense, can be said to be a human soul or person. Hmm. Well, that that generated another, another question and... and... Uh, feel free to say no if, if you like, but what about, for example, about demons? If we would say that a demon possesses a human body when they're exercised or they just leave, let's say, would we say that a, a, a demon or that spiritual substance uh, was human? No, now that's a really good question, but I do not think that demonic possession is a case of the of an of a union so intimate as the union of the soul with its body. The uh, union of the soul with its body is much much more intimate than an indwelling demon. Uh, that demon doesn't become a human person in virtue of his indwelling 
someone he because he's not as intimately connected to that body as that person's soul is so all of this discussion of the divinity of christ and his humanity comes because we have biblical data that indicates that he claimed to be divine and that he performed miracles and wonders that pointed to his self-understanding as divine considering the application of old testament texts originally attributed to yahweh to jesus in the new testament as well how can we defend the history the historical authenticity of these events and titles against claims that they are merely theological embellishments and projections from the Old Testament onto the life of Jesus. The importance of these passages where New Testament authors use proof texts about Yahweh in application to Jesus is that they show that New Testament Christians believed in the deity of Christ, uh, and therefore in the Trinity in some sense. Now, if you want to ask the further question, well, what good reason is there to believe in the deity of Christ? I would say that Jesus put himself in the place of God by his radical personal claims. If God has raised him from the dead, then God has unequivocally committed himself um, to Jesus and vindicated those alleg uh, allegedly blasphemous claims for which he was crucified. So that it is not simply uh, an application of uh, texts to Jesus by later New Testament authors. Rather, in the resurrection of Jesus, we have grounds for thinking that Jesus was, in fact, God incarnate. Let me push back a little bit on that. What if a skeptic would say that Jesus' radical claims in the New Testament are those, are, or are part of those theological embellishments? Oh. Uh, that is like the, the New Testament authors put words in the mouth of Jesus that he didn't actually say those things. Well, that is going to be part of so-called historical apologetics. And in my book, Reasonable Faith, I have a chapter on the self-understanding of Jesus where I try to give historical arguments to show that among the claims of Jesus that are authentic, that were uttered by the historical Jesus, are claims to be the Messiah, to be the Son of God in a unique sense, and to be the divine human Son of Man prophesied by the prophet Daniel. In addition to that, there are all sorts of implicit Christological claims that Jesus makes, such as his claim to be able to forgive sins. Um, and so I think you can show that these do belong to the historical Jesus and are not just later additions. All right. I guess that answers another question that popped up right when you were talking about this. And it's related to what we we just discussed. What if somebody were to push back and say and mirror what you've claimed about Genesis one to eleven being of the mytho historical genre, oh. and say that the these claims of divinity in the mouth of Jesus are are some sort of historical theology genre. Um, and then it becomes very difficult for us like, to identify the historical elements of the story from this theological embellishments. Well, that's a wonderful question because it serves to highlight both the plausibility of my genre analysis of Genesis 1 to 11 and the historical credibility of the Gospels. Back in the 19th century, uh, New Testament critics did try to interpret the claims of Jesus in terms of pagan mythology, of divine human figures like Hercules uh, and Apollonius of Tyana. And some even tried to show that the Gospels are ultimately based in these pagan mythological figures. And that movement soon collapsed uh, due principally to two factors. First of all, the parallels were spurious these uh, so-called divine human men uh, 
were not, in fact, uh, parallel to the stories of Jesus' incarnation and resurrection. And secondly, there was, in any case, no genealogical connection between these two. There's a clear distinction between an analogy and a genealogy, and these um, pagan uh, figures were not causally connected to the first disciples and their belief in Christ. Um, And therefore, this attempt to interpret Jesus against the backdrop of mythology has been completely eclipsed in contemporary New Testament studies. Uh, You won't find anyone um, who is a bona fide historical Jesus scholar uh, defending the mythological interpretation today. Rather, what has happened in the 20th century, the second half of it, is what's been called the Jewish reclamation of Jesus. It's been rediscovered that the proper historical backdrop for interpreting Jesus of Nazareth is not pagan mythology, but first century Palestinian Judaism. And against that backdrop, the Gospels emerge as very credible historical sources for Jesus' life and teachings. Now, another element not directly related to the Incarnation, although it uh, it's part of it, is a controversial topic on your denial of the doctrine of eternal processions or the eternal sonship of Jesus. Uh, could you define really, in a nutshell, what the, what this doctrine means and why do you reject it? Well, let's be careful here, Raul. I don't deny mm-hmm. or reject it. I just don't believe it. And that is very oh. different. Uh, I just don't see any good reason to think it's true, but I do not um, say that it's necessarily false. Um, I just don't think it's biblically grounded, and so I I don't accept it. Um, But the doctrine is really part of the doctrine of the Trinity rather than the doctrine of the Incarnation. It is the doctrine that somehow God the Father is the fount of, of the other two persons of the Trinity, that the Son somehow proceeds out of the Father. He is begotten from the Father, from all eternity past. And the analogy to this that is often used is the way in which a sunbeam emanates from the Son. The Son is the primary object, and then the sunbeam Um, proceeds from it. And then the Holy Spirit is similarly said to proceed ultimately from the Father um, as the Son does. So among the persons of the Trinity, they are not all equal in that sense. One is the source of the other two. It derives from the Lagos Christology of the Greek apologist. Early Christian apologists like Tatian and Athenagoras and Justin Martyr interpreted the Gospel of John when it speaks of the Word or the Logos, which in the beginning was with God and was God, in terms of the procession of the Logos out of God the Father. Sometimes the Logos is thought of as the mind of the Father, and the Logos proceeds out of the Father and becomes a distinct person from the Father. And it is this primitive Logos Christology that then gets embedded in conciliar documents like the Nicene Creed in saying that the second person of the Trinity is eternally begotten of the Father according to his divinity, and then uh, temporally begotten of the Virgin Mary, according to his humanity. All right. In your Defenders class on the doctrine of the Trinity, you discuss the Logos as a principle rooted in Middle Platonism, notably similar to concepts found in Philo's works. Given that the Holy Spirit inspired John's Gospel to reflect such philosophical ideas, why should we hesitate to embrace 
these aspects of Middle Platonism and Logos Christology as embraced by the early Greek apologists? Well, I think our final authority for Christian doctrine must remain Scripture alone. Uh, philosophical notions are acceptable only insofar as they cons are consistent with the teaching of Scripture. So Middle Platonic doctrines need to be assessed in terms of their consistency with Scripture. All right. Well, one could argue that uh, John called uh, the second person of the Trinity the Logos, and yes. uh, in, Logo in John 1.1, 1, 1, what is the meaning behind John calling Jesus the Logos, or is it just to reflect the Middle Platonist idea of thinking of the Logos as the mind of God and the agent through whom God creates the world, or what is the meaning behind it? I think that John is struggling to enunciate the idea that although there is only one God, there is a diversity of persons within God. And so it is a kind of primitive Trinitarianism, or at least Binitarianism, where you have one being, one God, but there is a distinction of persons within God, the, the Father and the Son. On to another biblical text, in Hebrews 1, 5 to 6, we read, For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you? Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. It seems that the word when functions as a clause that points that the latter saying occurs at the moment of the incarnation. But this would imply that the former occurs before the incarnation. Here, Jesus is called Son and Begotten. How did you interpret this if you do not believe that Jesus is eternally begotten from the Father? Mm -hmm. Well, it seems to me that both of these verses plausibly have to do with either the incarnation or with the creation. Even Middle Platonism does not, so far as I know, postulate the eternal begetting of the Logos from God. And so uh, I'm reluctant to read uh, pretty heavy-duty metaphysics into this text from Hebrews. I think this is probably about the best you can do, but um, I think that's an awful lot of metaphysical freight to put on this verse. All right. Well, for the... Um, geeks that like our original Greek, uh, one of them asked, in the original Greek, in these texts, the word begotten in verse 5 is a perfect tense construction, which underlies that it is a past action with continuous relevance. Coupled with the temporal conjunction when in verse 6, it seems a fairly solid biblical argument for the eternal generation of the Son. Well, I think that depends on what it means uh, by today. The verse says, uh, to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Uh, how you interpret this passage depends entirely on what today refers to. And if that is a reference to the incarnation or to creation, uh, then it would not support an eternal begetting of the Son from the Father. All right. Another biblical proof text for the eternal generation view is John 5, 26, which reads, For just as the Father has life in himself, so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. Some have used this passage to argue that the second person of the Trinity, the Son, receives or derives his life from the Father. How would you interpret this passage? Well, if you read the context, Raul, it seems to me that it's referring to the resurrection and not to the incarnation. Let me read to you the context of that verse. Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead 
will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself, and has given him authority to execute judgment, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. And so I think this enigmatic passage more plausibly has to do with Christ as uh, uh, um, having been given the authority to give life to those uh, to whom he wills. All this discussion about the eternal generation of the Son and Logos Christology, um, some, some people have biblical arguments, other philosophical arguments, and, and as you say, our ultimate authority needs to be Scripture and what Scripture teaches. Yes. Can you provide for us some names or resources by New Testament scholars that defend scripturally that Jesus' sonship began at the Incarnation and that the eternal procession from the Father is not biblically grounded? I think one of the best discussions of this is in Murray Harris's book, Jesus as God. Murray Harris, Jesus as God. He has a very good discussion of these passages of uh, Jesus in John's Gospel as the only begotten of the Father. And I think you could pick up almost any commentary on the Gospel of John, frankly, uh, for this. For example, the commentary by Raymond Brown will discuss whether or not this is talking about an eternal procession from the Father. The New Testament seems to teach that God the Father appointed his Son as King over all creation until all is subject under his feet. Once this is accomplished, the Son will surrender the kingdom to God and subject himself to him so that God will be all in all. This seems to suggest that the Father directed the attention of the creatures to the Son, but that in the future, the Son will direct all attention back to the Father while subjecting himself to him. If this is the case after the resurrection and when everything is back into God's plan with his people in the afterlife, wouldn't this mean that the eternal, that Christ will be eternally submitted to the Father, indicating this kind of uh, relationship of eternal procession? I think that what we have here, Raul, is the distinction between the economic trinity and the ontological trinity. The ontological trinity is uh, the persons of the trinity considered in and of themselves uh, having all the same properties of divinity and greatness, and therefore co-equal. But the economic trinity concerns the different roles that they play in the plan of salvation. And in the economic trinity, it is correct that the Son submits to and does the will of the Father and eventually turns over the kingdom uh, to the Father. Just as in a family... The husband and the wife are co-equals, but the wife submits to her husband for the sake of the family. So Christ and the Father are co-equal, but the Son submits to the Father for the sake of our salvation. The Council of Chalcedon affirms that Jesus is begotten before all ages of the Father according to the Godhead. Why should we follow the Council of Chalcedon in the Incarnation, but not in the Eternal Processions? Because the doctrine of eternal processions is not adequately grounded biblically. I think you can see from our discussion today how thin the biblical basis is for the doctrine of the eternal processions. Uh, by contrast, uh, we have, I think, absolutely convincing evidence that the New Testament authors thought of Christ and the Holy Spirit as fully God uh, and yet distinct persons from the Trinity. 
So it seems to me that we have really good grounds for accepting what Chalcedon says about the Incarnation, but not about the eternal processions. I also think that the doctrine of eternal processions seems to depreciate the person of Christ. He depends upon the Father for his existence in the same way that a creature depends upon God for its existence. And I think that should give us serious pause. Do we really want to subordinate the Son to the Father ontologically rather than merely economically? I think that does tend to depreciate the Son, and that gives me real reservations about this doctrine. I think that generates a good segue to one of our last questions, which says, Dr. Craig, you have argued against the doctrine of eternal processions by stating that if Jesus is ontologically dependent of the Father of his, for his existence, then he lacks a seity, which is an essential attribute of divinity. However, we acknowledge that an essential attribute of God is to be triune, yet the Father alone, nor Jesus, nor the Holy Spirit, is triune. This suggests that not all divine properties are essential to individual divine persons. Could it then be possible that Jesus does not possess aseity and still remains full with, uh, or still retains full divinity? This Person would the be the best way to def defend divine aseity um, along with the eternal processions that the Godhead has a seity, but not the Son and the Holy Spirit. Um, but nevertheless, notice that even if you say that, the, the Father still seems superior to the Son, in that the Father does exist, ah, say, um, but the Son does not. The Son is dependent um, upon the Father for his existence. And that kind of ontological subordination, I think, depreciates the person of the Son and his greatness, uh, and, and is therefore a view that we should accept only if we have really convincing reasons biblically to do so. And I, I don't think we have uh, convincing reasons biblically to adopt this doctrine. Well, uh, we're almost at the end of uh, this Q&A on the Doctrine of the Incarnation, and this will come as a surprise for some of our chapter directors in the audience, but we have a second date to continue discussing on the Doctrine of the Incarnation, where we'll be touching on your particular model of Neo-Apollinarianism. So, uh, just to leave a cliffhanger here, why don't you uh, explain to us uh, what your model is and um, the implications of uh, your Christological model of Neo-Apollinarianism? Well, very simply stated, it is that the Logos, the second person of the Trinity, is the soul of Jesus Christ. So the Incarnation is the Logos' taking on flesh, assuming a hominin body as his own uh, so that Jesus Christ is both truly God and truly man. And I look forward to talking with you, Raul, and our chapter directors about this particular Neo-Apollinarian model. I must say, based on the questions today, I'm beginning to think that all of our chapter directors in Latin America are, are theologians. Uh, so that will be an interesting discussion to have together. I'll be very happy to connect with you again, Dr. Drake. Thank you so much for your time. I know you're very busy, and we're always blessed to learn from you. Thank you, and God bless all of you.